<laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's uh, jump into uh, what we are here to do, my friend. Um, the three, two, one. Welcome back to Decouple. Noah Retberg. Everyone knows who you are, although it's been a long time um, since you've been with us. Um, Noah, the reason I've brought you back, well, I have lots of things I'd like to talk to you about, so it's hard to narrow it down. But, you know, I was over in Dubai. Um, there was a great talk by Stefan Kvist, and I'm blanking on his co-presenter, but they were talking a lot about, um, you know, decarbonization, difficult to abate sectors. And nuclear, one of the uh, selling points that advocates will point to is that it does more than just electricity. It can provide heat, uh, which is something that, uh, you know, other low carbon options uh, struggle with. So I wanted to explore that today. We're going to call this episode Prospects for Process Heat. And uh, I guess this is sort of by necessity going to be a talk that's far ranging and looking at a few different um, reactor designs and what the uh, what the prospects are for them uh, coming through in this uh, tricky, tricky area of decarbonization. So Noah, again, <laughs> welcome back to the pod. It's been too long. Uh, it's uh, yes, it's uh, it's uh, nice to uh, to to be here again. Um, you had to get along without me. Don't know how that went. <laughs> Um, but uh, but I'm glad to be here again. It's certainly our, our, um, I always like like uh, our chats. So wonderful, wonderful. Yes, our, our Germany coverage has uh, has lapsed. You are you are our German correspondent. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that another time. How, how do you want to tackle? Well, it? at some point it gets bo- it gets boring to me to be like, yeah, it got worse again, and so. Okay, well let's let's jump into the uh, the matter at hand: prospects for process heat. And talk about some nuclear process heat applications. Um, you know, I, I guess part of part of this is, you know, if if this is such a exciting possibility, why why is it not happening, or why has it not happened? But I might be unaware. Maybe it has happened. Um, so let's let's maybe dive in historically. Up, but I'll, I'll let you pick sort of our our starting point. So let's let's start with uh, what uh, process heat is, um, and let's make one clear distinction. Because where we use heat, where we use thermal energy in our world, um, in most cases, we use the heat uh, to drive a heat engine and uh, generate work for mobile applications. For stationary applications, uh, power generate uh, work generation is done uh, by electricity in our times. In the past, it used to be also done with thermal heat. And also for like room heating for buildings, um, because if the building is cold, this makes us uncomfortable and sick. And also, just um, when a building just does is not uh, constantly heated at the time, um, the thermal expansion and contraction as the building heats up um, and cools down cyclically can damage a building. So, um, but process heat is distinct from that. Um, process heat is the heat that we use uh, to drive uh, production processes. Um, and when we talk about these production processes, we usually talk about heat that we use to modify that we use to work on something which we modify thermally. This could be um, more home cooking or industrial cooking when we make food or when we bake bread. These are um, process heat applications where we like use the heat to drive uh, chemical reactions like the Maillard reaction, browning. Uh, caramelizing flavors and such, but also just to evaporate steam, uh, to evaporate water, to um, cook our food. And also uh, process heat uh, is used in uh, metalworking. Um, processes like casting or forging come easily to mind when we um, talk about this. Um, but what should not be ignored is also um, annealing and hardening. So where we uh, use uh, heat application to uh, to a workpiece, not to um, make it malleable, but to rearrange its crystalline structure to make it more or less hard in order to make a hard tool or make an annealed metal that can bend into the shape we need. So, um, but also in in, in chemical industry, uh, in the oil and gas sector, um, generally heat to use heat to evaporate or um, a bit melt stuff, um, especially for the purpose of separating, be that separating water, uh, ethanol out of water if you want to make uh, spirits, or be that uh, separating gasoline out of uh, raw oil if we want to make fuels. These are thermal processes. Um, 
Similarly, when we want to dry out stuff, we use we use process heat. When we um, uh, when we have, for example, in the paper mating industry, we use process heat to uh, dry out the paper pulp to make solid sheets of paper or cardboard. And in excuse me, and in one other aspect is also to use process heat to drive chemical reactions. When we, for example, make concrete or when we uh, prepare metal ore, we deal with uh, carbonate salts essentially. With concrete, it's or cement, it's uh, calcium carbonate, and which uh, needs to be turned into calcium oxide to make uh, cement, be that Portland or uh, simple mo- Portland cement or simple mortar. We first need to drive uh, the process of putting the carbon dioxide of a carbonate salt, and this is an endothermic reaction. So we need to put a lot of heat into it to make the um, is the result. Also, when we have like iron ore. Of these are often carbonate salts, so we need to roast the iron ore and to break down the carbonate salts in there, so we can uh, uh, separate our ore. So uh, there, basically, when we look at it, the process heat can be used for like um, evaporation of liquid, for um, changing um, the material structure of uh, a workpiece directly to to a liquid phase. If we talk about melting or just making it more malleable, or just rearranging the crystalline structure in hardening or annealing, or to drive uh, chemical re- endothermic chemical reactions. So um, our process heat applications essentially boil down to these processes. No, that, that's, <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's a very, you know, you've enriched my understanding already, remarkably. Um, you know, we, we hear about different temperatures that are required to do these different processes you mentioned, and I love just tying it into the you know, it's something we do so mundanely every single day, cooking our food, for instance. Um, but we hear that that is a potential limitation right now. I think um, conventional um, water, cooled water, moderated plants, nuclear plants produce, uh, you know, waste heat or process heat that's insufficient to do a lot of these reactions. Can you talk about the different grades of heat required to do each of these things and, you know, how high we can go uh, conceptually with with some of the nuclear designs being considered? So generally... One thing that we need to get familiar with when we talk about process heat application is that we need to get our heat from where it is generated into where we want it. And this can be very as simple as uh, putting like a piece of iron that or steel that we want to forge directly into the burning coal. So there the heat transfer is very simple and very obvious to us. Um, or just if we could at home, the heat transfer from our stove, be it gas or electric, um, into our food is also clearly understandable to us through uh, either conductivity or through just the um, um, the gases released in the combustion directly heating our workpiece. But in many cases in industry, the heat transfer process is very complex. And in many of these complex cases, it is done um, with usually with uh, thermal oils or with steam. And um, But there are limits to where uh, we can use steam or thermal oils as a um, a heat transfer system. So I I talked about limits after that. So where we are limited with our steam, where the steam cannot reach us, we either heat directly with the heat released from our um, combustion gases. So in most metal working processes, you use the combustion gases to heat either your metal directly or to heat light um, the vessel in which your metal is contained, like if you have a ceramic, um, if you have a ceramic pot uh, where you have your molten metal and you heat that with the combustion gases. But even this, um, um, if you are talking about metals which need to get really hot, it, well exceeding uh, 1,000, um, approaching the 2,000 uh, degrees Celsius range, um, you can also not reach this with uh, con with the conventional conduction exhaust gases or your um, vessel anymore. So in this range, you either need electric arcs generating um, um, plasma, which can exceed uh, the 3,000 degrees Celsius range, and uh, or what you would need is inductive heating, which only works uh, with uh, conductive uh, things, so basically just metal. And with inductive heating, you generate, uh, you apply an uh, oscillating magnetic field at the outside of your metal, and then uh, eddy currents 
will form inside, uh, will be generated by the oscillating magnetic field inside metal and heat the metal from inside. So um, this also inductive heating is used for hardening processes. Um, at work, uh, in, in the in workshop where I work, I have uh, lathes which, for example, have um, uh, inductively hardened uh, bedways. So where just in, uh, the eddy currents are used to heat up the cast iron and then the cast iron is trenched and the crystalline structure makes the cast iron heat. So inductive heating... Um, so inductive heating is not just something that uh, is very useful when you cook food. It is essential for um, many modern process heat applications because you can't just read, it can reach temperatures that exhaust gases uh, could not reach. And it is in many cases much more, e much more easily applicable. You can, for example, directly heat just the top of the bed wave of my lathe rather than just heating up the entire bed wave. So you can use it also to um, apply heat precisely. You can use it to apply heat uh, in very hot temperatures. And you can also, if you want to reach very hot temperatures, you can also use electric arch, arch furnaces, which are essentially unlimited in where they go. But we use them for um, applications in industry where we go beyond the 2000 degrees Celsius range or also for uh, melting down steel. So it, it sounds like, you know, any, any sort of power source that can generate electricity is capable of uh, electric arc. And I'm not sure if induction is is an electrically driven process. So what are, like, if, if we're trying to eliminate uh, carbon-based carbon-based fuels uh, out of the equation, um, what are the areas that are that are sort of most difficult, the temperature ranges that are most difficult to get into, not just in terms of getting to that temperature, but in terms of volume of processes that, that need to run? Um, again, I've heard, you know, nuclear can be excellent for things like district heating. Again, that is not uh, process, process heating. But in terms of the vast majority of the world's processes that, that require heat, um, What's the not the lowest hanging fruit, but the the largest areas that need to be addressed if we were to stop using again carbon based fuels for for process heat? Um, so process heat consumption makes up around a third of our energy consumption. Um, it depends on the country. Here in Germany, it's a bit less than a third, but roughly a third. And even lower half now, right? Of the process. Um, the figures that I I know are a bit dated, so uh, could be, and. Um, and of that um, of the process heat, around half um, sits at temperatures below 500 degrees Celsius, and these are the temperatures where usually um, steam is used as the heat transfer fluid. Um, using steam as a, a heat transfer fluid beyond these 500 degrees is not very practical. Modern steam generators struggle with um, getting steam much hotter than uh, 650 degrees Celsius. So even in the most modern coal plant, you usually don't have steam generators which grow beyond these temperatures. It just at these temperatures and the high pressures of the steam, just the um, heating, uh, heating pipes in the steam generators are straight put to their limit and um, are not as robust as at lower temperatures. So you can't really get beyond that. And so uh, the steam can only be generated um, to temperatures of around 650 degrees Celsius. So this limits you to a point. But and then you have to consider that what you are heating with your steam is of a lower temperature than your steam. And so above the 500 degrees Celsius range, steam is no longer really useful as a heat transfer fluid. And um, uh, this, where, this is like half of the process heat applications, which are essentially never going to be reached by nuclear energy. Because while you can make a nuclear reactor where you have the coolant, which is hotter than 650 degrees Celsius, um, you can't just pipe the coolant directly from the um, reactor to where your process heat is used. When you do that, you essentially make, uh, you require your entire industrial plant to be uh, monitored for radiation, which is essentially a big reason why many utilities don't use, uh, don't want to use boiling water reactors. Is in the boiling water reactors, the primary circuit runs through the turbine, so the turbine has to be monitored for radiation, and uh, you have to treat the turbine building similarly to how you treat the reactor building and the pressurized water reactor. 
it can just be its own thing. It doesn't need uh, the intensive uh, radiation protection and monitoring. And similarly, for an industrial plant, you would not want to run the uh, to the um, reactor coolant directly into your industrial plant. You would want uh, a second um, medium to bridge to pass the energy on the heat on before you uh, you made the heat leave your nuclear island, and you would do this usually with steam. And there are, and the steam is limited to six hundred and fifty degrees Celsius. So we could simply say, I would say that half of all process heat applications will never be reached with nuclear ever unless you lose electricity to, um, for your heat. How, how energy intensive uh, are electric arc furnaces? Uh, how do they compare, say, to in steel production? How would that compare to just using uh, traditional methods? I've read an old paper, it's from the 80s, um, German paper, which comes to the conclusion that um, using an electric arc furnace to remelt scrap steel is about 40% more efficient um, than using coal directly to uh, melt down the steel because the electric arc furnaces um, can uh, use uh, apply their heat that they generate much more directly into the material compared to the traditional coal-fired method. Um, but keep in mind the study from the time used used uh, uh, state-of-the-art 80s era coal power plants um, and compared uh, compared it to how the uh, coal power plants running the electric arc furnaces to a state-of-the-art uh, conventional um, coal-fired uh, steel mating. So um, the electric arc furnaces are very efficient and they have an economic case to, there's an economic case to run electric arc furnaces to um, melt down steel. Even in a world where both your plant, uh, in, in a world where both uh, your electric arc furnace and your conventional melting would be powered entirely by coal. So, um, so I, I think one should kind of lose the understanding that using electricity to power process heat is inherently inefficient because in many cases using uh, combustion to power these processes also brings with it s itself uh, certain inefficiencies. You can apply the heat much more indirectly. You, cannot, uh, you have, have uh, transfer losses there. And you also um, you use a much more complicated process to heat up um, what you want to heat up. Many electric applications like induction or resistive or electric arc furnaces can put their heat much more directly onto where you want it. And they can also um, make it, can use a much less complex system because you can put the electric heater where it needs to be. You can put the induction coil where it needs to be. You can, for example, with my lathe, you can just put the induction um, uh, the induction coils above the, the bed waste directly, and you does not do not heat, need to heat the, uh, up the entire body of the lathe. So one should not underestimate the efficiencies of uh, the electric process. So, so I mean, there's a difference between um, you know energy analysis uh, of efficiencies and obviously economic efficiencies. Um, and you know, this is a criticism I hear a lot, um, a criticism of Butzlaff's meals work, or people talking about primary energy. A lot of folks, uh, particularly on the um, uh, you know, alt energy, I'm forgetting the, the exact term that people use now, right? But clean tech, they say, well, listen, it's actually not such a challenge to replace fossil fuels because you're talking primary energy, electric motors are much more efficient, for instance, we only need to pre pre replace about one third of primary energy. Um, but obviously, it's, it's fairly easy to dig something under the ground and burn it, um, even if you are wasting, you know, 70% of, of that heat as as waste heat, for instance. Um, so how, how does that work? I mean, there's a reason why the majority of the world's steel mills are not electric. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of juice, I'm guessing, to uh, run an electric arc furnace. We have a global electricity build. shortage as simple as that. Okay. Yeah. So just expand, one, one major reason. Expand on the kind of, yeah, the energy economics versus the, you know, the, the monetary economics of, of uh, electric arc furnaces. Uh, the, um, the energy economics... Um, so you, using your coal power plant, what, what I know, what I've read, though that is um, work from uh, the late 80s done here in Germany, is that the art furnaces are 40% more efficient. 
if we talk um, not just art furnaces, but the economy in general, um, a friend of mine, Florian Blüm, um, which uh, has a very fantastic blog, but most of your audience can't read him because it's in German. Um, he basically did uh, a calculation um, how much using um, these processes he would, how much energy you would need to decarbonize Germany with electricity only um, in a manner that would not lead to any um, loss of la uh, living standard or any loss of industrial output in Germany. So essentially decarbonize the entire German economy as of, I think, he used 2019, 2019 as a baseline without any loss of en industry, without any uh, loss of uh, quality of life. Um, and back then, Germany used around um, 3,500 terawatt hours of primary energy. Um, I think uh, 90 percent, around 90 percent of it, was was either uh, fossil or nuclear. Six percent was uh, nuclear back then. And then he um, he um, used he um, looked into which processes you would need to drive these. Um, he said that for most um, automotive applications, you would use battery electric. For a few applications, you would uh, use synthetic fuels made from hydrogen. Um, you would also use uh, synthetic fuels for, um, in his assumption, you would use uh, synthetic fuels uh, for some uh, power peaking. And you would use uh, for process heat almost entirely electric, uh, directly electrically powered. And for uh, home heating, you would use uh, heat pumps uh, backed up by synthetic fuels just for peak demand. And in his assumption, um, uh, where he used electricity only for basically process heat, uh, he got around 70% of the primary energy consumption that we do now have. So Germany would go down from... Uh, 3,500 terawatt hours of primary energy consumption and you would then get uh, 2,500 terawatt hours of electricity consumption to decarbonize the entire German economy um, with use, using 2019 as a baseline. And um, the methodology that he used, I tend to agree with. He, I mean, he, he excluded nuclear, uh, he excluded nuclear process heat from um, from the use and also excluded uh, the, uh, nuclear district heating. But if you would ju use just electricity only, then you would get to uh, similar numbers. So for for a in very industrialized uh, modern economy that has not seen a lot of deindustrialization like other Western countries, Germany 2019, you would probably you can probably reduce uh, your energy. Uh, you can have like 70% of your primary energy consumption, but just as electricity. So you get a little bit more efficiently, certainly, but uh, many of the clean tech advocates drastically overestimate the efficiency gains that they can get with uh, drawing electricity only, which comes from using basically electric vehicles as, as a comparative. They, they compare some a little bit unrealistic uh, efficiencies of, of modern electric vehicles. They usually um, take 80%. It's more like 70% uh, well-to-wheel. And they put that against outdated uh, combustion engines, which are at around 20%. Modern uh, combustion engines can go from 30% well above, uh, well above 30% up to 40% thermal efficiency. Um, and from comparing this 80% efficiency to 20% efficiency, they get the idea that they can uh, decarbonize the economy with um, they can decarbonize the economy with just a third of the energy that we use now in electricity. You will overall probably end up um, more with around 70% of the energy that we use now um, using the methodology of, of Mr. Blum. And I tend to agree with Mr. Blumen. I think um, either he should translate uh, this article or I should do it because it's 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 uh, very worth reading uh, to understand um, the different decarbonization processes that you would use in an electricity-only scenario. And this can give you some efficiencies, but not as much as uh, most people think. So suffice it to say, um, 
you know, a lot of these process heat applications would benefit from a baseload generator because we're trying to run them efficiently around the clock. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of obvious if, if you wanted to uh, electrify process heat, um, probably would have been good to keep those nuclear plants running. I don't think we need to belabor that point. And I want to move into some of the technologies that are being discussed um, that may be more ideal to process heat. And in my simplistic understanding, that'd be things like high temperature gas reactors, sodium fast reactors. I don't know if they have to be fast, but sodium reactors um, and uh, molten salt reactors. Am I missing anything? And can we maybe take a, a turn on each of these to try and understand um, their applications? I would like to add um, lead cooled and reactors cooled with supercritical water. Okay. Which is, um, you Canadians especially uh, did some very interesting research into um, water. Reactors tend to be cooled with supercritical water where you would have uh, supercritical water at temperatures exceeding 500 degrees inside your candle reactors. And according to what I've read, you even intended to use special zirconium alloys um, inside your reactor, which is very important because it's not like you can make uh, water reactors, not like you, you can very much make water reactors hotter than we currently do. But you would usually, in order to do that, put make the, the in, inners of the reactor. You would make them out of many of that would, would be made of steel. Steel is uh, absorbs much more neutrons. So if you would make the reactor hotter and you would make the reactor more of the uh, fuel cladding out of steel, you would make the reactor more thermally efficient but less neutronically efficient. And this is why it has never been done, because there is no reason to go more thermally efficient fuel is plenty enough and if the reactor is less neutronically efficient you don't even gain anything um, from it but um, there was uh, research in canada i think up until 2006 uh, by atomic energy of canada limited to into um, zirconium alloys which can sustain um, these higher temperatures and especially can sustain supercritical water which is much more aggressive than either hot water or hot steam and I'm not sure how much they got with this research. I know that it has been done. I would really love to see um, whether this can work. There hasn't been a lot of research into um, supercritically water-cooled reactors, um, where the supercritical refers to the water, not to the reactor. Um, I want to amend that. Um, but sadly, uh, there has not been happening a lot in this field lately. But I think we should mention So I, I don't want to... Yeah, I don't want to get lost into, uh, and I know because of your technical uh, expertise, we could spend hours on each of these. So um, I want to make sure that we don't bite off more than we can chew in the in the kind of about around half an hour we have left. Um, maybe why don't we go through a few of these technologies anyway, in what you consider to be um, the highest uh, likelihood of success or the, the best demonstrated track record or, or essentially the most likely to fill this this gap for, I guess, both high temperature steam with that caveat that it's kind of limited for processes above five, 600 C. Um, I guess we're focusing on that, right? Because, uh, you know, any old power reactor can make uh, electricity. The first high temperature reactors, which were built in any um, significant quality, not that there is really another type of high temperature reactors that has been built in significant quality. And these were the advanced gas reactors by the British. And um, usually when we, say advanced reactor, we think of like um, some modern paper reactors, but these were reactors which were designed in the 60s and built in the 70s and 80s in Britain. So this is very much an established technology. Um, that's also a technology where we can kind of see some of the promises by the hot temperature falling apart. The British wanted to build these um, advanced gas cooled reactors as an uh, improvement upon their um, earlier generation Magnox reactors, which cooled, with, which were cooled with um, uh, also with CO2, hot CO2, but couldn't generate steam significantly hotter than water cooled reactors. And the advanced gas reactors were planned to generate steam um, exceeding the temperatures um, which coal power plants back in the 60s could reach, much more akin to the temperatures modern coal power plants can reach in the uh, 600 degree range, and so I think uh, the steam that they generate is, is more than 550, if I'm not wrong. Um, but their reactor, uh, the CO2 inside the reactor gets up to 750 degrees. So they um, generate superheated steam, and they therefore can run much more efficient turbines. Um, 
and there has been uh, it has been looked into whether uh, the using the advanced test hold reactors um, might be interesting as a source of process heat in Britain for both industry and for generation of hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen was never really put in fruition, and most of the British nuclear power plants are too far away from industry to really be useful for this purpose. So this has not uh, has never been done. Um, also, there are other problems of the advanced gas grid reactors. Um, basically, almost all of them were over budget and um, um, over uh, their st- over schedule. So. You can say that this might be a feasible issue. There have been light, new, uh, light water reactors which have been over budget and behind schedule as well. Um, but unluckily, the, almost all of them were. They had never really great uh, capacity factor, even as the technology matured. Um, as Is there a reason why? Re- um, essentially, they uh, because they yeah, they um, they use uh, steel uh, cladding for their fuel elements. The fuel element, the 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 burn up in the elements is not as great, so they need to change uh, fuel elements much more often. Um, they were tried, and in some of them they used on uh, um, online refueling, but in many of them uh, this was not achieved. So they use a very time consuming offline refueling. So they are offline for for a lot of time for um, refueling and maintenance. Um, also, as they got older, there were material issues inside the power plants, and many of them had to be derated and uh, now run on significantly reduced power. Whereas in almost in, in almost all um, light water reactors, we have uh, gotten power up rates. Um, some very crazy Swedish nuclear power plants, which has seen uh, almost a third. 30% increase of power in up rates. Um, the British had to derate their reactors. Also, these reactors, especially when you consider them of over all of their uh, lifetime, these have been costly to build. They will be costly to decommission. Also, the uh, fuel handling and uh, fuel disposal is much more costly than light water reactors. So you can generate uh, processes with the AGR design. You can generate the very hot steam that you would need to um fulfill in the entire half of process heat demands that you can meet with hot, very hot steam. But this, react, this steam would be much more costly than um, probably using electricity from a light water reactor directly. And there are and these reactors are not, not as reliable as light water reactors are. So they will probably... Ne- and also the British completely gave up the design, so we will not see them in the future. How do, how do the AGRs compare to like a, what's, you know, X energy or a high temperature gas reactor? I think that's a German uh, technology, the pebble bed or triso fuel. I'm, I'm out of my water here. Uh, help, help me understand the difference. Um, I think triso fuel first, first done, uh, first used in, uh, or first came up with, uh, were actually also the Brits. The Brits had like a four tier, master plan of mastering the gas cooled reactor, including where the fourth tier were like gas cooled fast reactors, and uh, the second tier were the AGRs. And the third tier would have um, they would have envisioned to be uh, tricer reactors, just as um, its energy uh, tries to do. The um, tricer reactors using helium as a coolant and the tricer fuel. They had a demonstration reactor the, at, um, I think, the, they had the Dragon reactor, a demonstration reactor, which had no turbine, just a uh, heat output, um, which they used to research uh, tricer fuel reactors. But they gave it up, especially when uh, the AGRs became a much more traveled reactor. And then in the late 80s, they looked into building light water reactors instead. So um, with the Brits canceling their tire gas reactor program, so that the British tricer reactor program, there has also been an American and a German endeavor into this. The American one used uh, triso fuel in prismatic fuel elements at the nuclear power plant at, uh, at Fort McGrain. Uh, What's a prismatic fuel element? Like I- I'm understanding uh, high temperature gas reactors, or at least the uh, maybe pebble bed is the wrong word. I guess the, the triso fuel is kind of like a bubble gum machine. And the gases are moving up through these balls, essentially, that are all, you know, lying together. And I guess they get shifted and moved uh, in terms of not necessarily refueling, but just fuel management. 
which is very, very different from the AGR. I, I visited Hunterston B and, and that was an AGR and they just had these insane fuel elements. The, the um, uh, graphite core you were talking about was just massive. I mean, these are like seven, eight story buildings plus three stories for the refueling machine. So I'm trying to get a sense of how they differ physically as well. And just for our listeners that aren't aware of, you know, prismatic things oh, like so, 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 so the prismatic fuel just, just means it's more like a traditional fuel element made up of rods. Okay. That, that's gotcha. the head sentinel shape. And then when you, it's, when you extend, uh, um, a polygonal sh um, uh, surface, uh, you get a prisma, so prismatic gen just a general shape. So imagine it more like a traditional, uh, that very much like a traditional reactor. And the um, the <laughs> bubble drum design is the uh, tricer reactor design that came from Germany. It was realized in two reactors here in Germany. First the AVR in the in the sixties, and then the THDR in the eighties. Um, the these uh, these these were envisioned um, as to simplify the refueling processes, because refueling a non-water cooled reactor is not trivial. In a water cooled reactor, you can basically open the reactor entirely, stare down into the reactor, because you have water on top of it, and the water shields you, and you can then move the um, fuel element. Under the, the hot fuel element under the water. In a non-water cooled reactor, you need to use much more complicated fuel handling systems, be that sodium or gas cooled or whatever. Um, it's not as trivial. So in order to make the refueling much more easier, they envisioned a design where you would just load the um, cold nuclear fuel, the unused nuclear fuel, on the top as spheres, and then the spheres would like fall down, and on the bottom you remove the you remove the spheres, and the spheres drop drop right into the um, storage container. To have a much Bubble more simple uh, refueling process, which was envisioned to make these reactors um, much more economical and much more and much more reliable, since the simplified refueling process, as they envisioned would also um, increase downtime when refueling the law for actually for online refueling. Um, but these bubble gum type reactors, as we tried here in Germany, as its energy um, wants to try, as uh, the Chinese uh, have built two reactors, which they are currently operating, though they are not operating them um, quite as well as they hope to. So these tricer fueled reactors also have a problem with these um, um, spherical fuel elements. You don't have like a very clearly defined um, flow for your gas uh, through the reactor. Inside um, with like what the AGR or the prismatically fueled tricer reactors, since you have traditional fuel elements, which are always at the same place, you always know where your fuel is, uh, where your, your um, coolant is flowing in very uh, straight, very direct and uh, controllable lines. This is not the case um, inside your um, pebble bed reactor. You have a chaotic um, sea of spheres and the coolant tries to move around there. Also in these uh, pebble beds, the coolant also, uh, the spheres also rub against each other as they uh, fall down and as they transfer through the reactor. Also, when you want to insert um, control rods inside the reactor, this becomes an issue. Um, these pebbles are not like water. If you ram a control rod in there, you get a lot of friction. And this became a huge problem at the um, bitter one of the German pebble bed reactors. These control rods broke the um, fuel elements. Also, the fuel elements broke as they rubbed against each other and transferred through the um, down to the reactor. So this this reactor had a large amount of uh, fuel element failures and a large amount of uh, radioactivity release coming uh, from this design of reactor and this design of fuel element. One has to mention that the fuel design, the, the, the fuels used in the um, fuel in the German reactors, is certainly of a lesser quality than the triso fuel. The triso, um, so triso stands for a, a tri tristructural fuel. So um, the essential fuel pellet inside uh, is coated three times by a ceramic. And uh, in the German one, they had to coat it just uh, two times. So you can say that the fuel that its energy is going to use in the reactor, 
certainly of a much more quali better quality than uh, what the German reactor used in the 80. And also, since they use a smaller reactor, smaller reactor in power output, they use a somewhat different design than the big reactor that we had here in Germany. They use a design where they um, have, rather than control rods, which ram directly into the um, fuel elements, they have control rods at the outside of the reactor vessel, which they can turn, and just uh, they can uh, they can control how much neutrons escape the uh, reactor vessel, and therefore can control the reaction from the outside. This way of reactor control is much less damaging to the fuel, but it has also drawbacks. It is much less powerful. Its control authority over the nuclear reaction is much smaller, and Reactors larger than a certain size can can no longer be controlled by this uh, by this type of control rods. In the small trisofuel pebble bed reactor, which we had here in Germany in the 60s, the AVR, they also used the external control rod, um, which would not be inside the vessel but outside of it. These, uh, this reactor had not enough control authority with the external control rods over its um, over its reactor. They struggled to shut the reactor down on several occasions where the, where the um, control rods did not have enough authority to properly throttle down the reactor. So the, um, the design with the control rods at the outside has the problem that it can generate much, much less power than the one with the uh, control rods ramming inside the vessel. And also it might not have enough control authority at all. This has been a problem at the, at the German uh, reactors. Whether um, its energy has addressed this issue, I cannot say. I'm, there's not enough uh, for me to know about their design. But this has been a problem that, uh, that its energy certainly needs to overcome. And it limits their reactor to a certain size. The German reactor was uh, 17 megawatts electric. And it still had the problems that it had not enough control authority. I do wonder whether the um, 100, 100 megawatt can do this. And whether they want to go above the 100 megawatts, they will either need uh, prismatic fuel or they need to um, have the design where the control rods move inside the um, sea of pebbles. And hopefully this time the pebbles won't break. So uh, this is probably quite simplistic analysis, but in terms of assessing the commercial and you know operational maturity of a technology, it does seem useful to look at sort of the number of reactor years of operation. And I think our light water and pressurized heavy water fleets are up in the 17,000 reactor years of operation. And, and that's me meant that we've worked through a lot of kinks. We've identified a lot of problems. Um, we've innovated based upon operational experience and gotten to the exceptional capacity factors we now have, which are part of what makes um, economical, nuclear economical, um, you know, in terms of getting a sense of these other technologies. And I think for today's show, I think we should just focus on, on gas reactors just for the limit of time that we have the hard stop I have. Um, what's, the, what's the, the number of sort of reactors of operational experience we have? I think molten salt reactors is about three. It's all in national labs, um, and sodium reactors, sodium fast reactors run to several hundreds. What about the uh, the gas reactor technologies? Uh, the advanced gas reactors in, in, in the UK are going to give us a lot, but these pebble bed reactors or the, the bubble gum machine reactors? Well, with the British reactors, we're probably talking around like 600, 700 reactor years of operation. Though one might argue that with the large downtime that this reactor had, where the one could actually count a reactor year, the same way you count light water reactor here. Um, with the um, with the pebble bed reactor, it is uh, much worse. And Dragon reactor in Britain, which was never a power plant, just a demonstration reactor, only gives you a couple of years. The AVR in Germany only gives you a couple of years. Um, the, Ford, the American one, which wasn't even one of the um, pebble bed reactor, well, it used twice a few, but didn't uh, have the pellets only have a couple of years. And the really big German one, uh, the THDR, didn't get two years. Um, and in over this, it, it really only was built in uh, 13 years. No uh, German nuclear reactor was ever this expensive in relation to its power and took this long to build. And um, after all this long uh, build time, 
the reactor ran terribly. It basically needed to go offline every three days and had that 20% capacity factor over the time. It ran for a good 500 days and then it was uh, shut down because uh, the the project partners, which um, funded it, um, saw the design failing and then they dropped out and then the program had to be uh, shut down. So um, from the THTR, you only get like uh, 500 um, operational days probably. And what these operational days give you, they indicate a lot of problems. They don't uh, give a lot of um, practical experience. It's more like you ran it for 500 days, all of which were miserable, all of which um, show you the problems, but don't really show you the solutions to the problems. And um, after the THTR in Germany shut down in um, 89, after that, we never had another one until the Chinese opened theirs um, a good year ago. And from these two, we now have two more operational years. And hopefully these two will um, provide a significant amount of operational years. But when we talk about total operational years of the TRISO high temperature reactor, um, we are barely in the double digits. So this leads me to propose a new definition of advanced nuclear. Advanced nuclear is the nuclear that advanced. <laughs> the kind of nuclear that survived, that proved itself operational and, and commercial. Um, and that is essentially the nuclear that we have with us today. And then we have non-advanced nuclear, which is nuclear that has yet to advance, um, that has only made it you know, a few you know, single-digit, double-digit, uh, reactor years of operation because I, I just see this incredible hubris and the the kind of um, promotional materials they look amazing right and to a policymaker who has not got the kind of in depth background knowledge that you have or that many of my other guests have they see a promotional uh, PowerPoint uh, looks great this looks brand spanking new shiny okay it's it's going to deliver on X Y and Z promise but I think what policymakers are lacking is you know the history and that was why it was amazing to have Nick Turan on the other day to give us some context. Um, you know, many, many concepts have been tried from the 50s onwards, and the advanced ones advanced, and those that did not advance did not. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't develop that, those technologies more, but I think it does probably suggest that there needs to be a lot less hubris in terms of just saying, you know, this is going to be commercially mature. We're going to have, uh, you know, X energy reactors distilling petrochemicals, uh, Dow Chemical in, you know, five, 10 years, and doing so, you know, commercially um, and, and economically diatribe over but I, th I think you get my point so can i first just say i would think it would be really funny if in all your future appearances and nowadays you get invited to a lot of them you refer to these ad reactors as the yet to advance reactors rather than the advanced reactors i think this is gotcha. a nice thing <laughs> just like uh um, with like with the smrs um um i am quite sympathetic to uh, to the people with the hubris. I am, unlike you, I'm not a pessimist. I'm actually an optimist. But um, I don't know. I cannot have my hope. Uh, I don't have the... Maybe I don't have the co enough cognitive dissonance that I can, like, keep my optimism whenever I... Whenever people point out... Um, the flaws for that I have in my reason for my optimism. So other than other people who need to have the connect, um, uh, uh, have the cognitive dis. I'm sorry, I, I worked a lot today. Um, other than the people who have a lot of cognitive dissonance, I cannot just stand with what my views were. I need to um, refrain them and I need to change them because I don't like it how I feel when I'm not an optimist. So whenever my optimistic vision gets challenged, I get much more motivated uh, to find out like another way. So every time um, it was pointed out to me that my reasons for an optimism were flawed, I adjusted it and found reason to found a better way. So when it was pointed out to me that my reason to be optimistic about renewables was flawed, I changed there and when I, I realized that my reason to be optimistic about the yet to advance reactors was flawed 
I needed to change my outlook from there. I'm not a pessimist. I am quite optimistic that with the reactors that we have, which are actually mature, um, first and foremost pressurized and boiling water reactors, and second, sodium cooled reactors. I'm very confident and very optimistic that um, we can completely decarbonize with these. And this is the foundation of my optimism. And I am therefore critical of people who just, um, who are as gung ho on the yet to advance reactors because I. I don't want to be gloomy. I want to have um, a, a, a well-founded optimism so I can sleep well at night. And if I would need to put my hope on something where I'm not certain enough that it can actually work, um, that would not make me sleep well at night. So I need to be. I need to have my optimism grounded in rea reality. But I'm sympathetic to people who strive uh, for a lot of things and who say, um, like my conservative optimism is not good enough for them they want more and i cheer on them but and i really hope that its energy achieves what it set out to achieve um prove that uh maybe the uh the german engineers um uh which did the high temperature gas reactors in the 80s were not maybe the best quality of engineers and personally what i have found out um the nuclear engineers in Germany, which went into high into high temperature reactors, were not made from the same wood as the nuclear reactor engineers that went into the light water reactors. So they're not as competent and nice people. Maybe the edge energy people are much more competent and they can use much more modern tools to fulfill their vision. I still think that um, operational experience, both in cumulative reactor years and in how many reactor years the oldest reactor has put on his uh, stomach. Um, I think this is really important if you have um, a proper and uh, well-researched mature design. And this, cannot, this, this operational experience cannot be replaced by having better CAM and CAD software and having better milling machines and forges than we had in the 80s and better material sciences with the fuel. There needs to be uh, the operational experience for a mature design. Um, I really hope its energy proves me one. If its energy sets out what it achieves, I can sleep very well at night. I would be very happy about that. I would gladly buy nuclear synthetic fuels from them and put them in my car and have fun driving over the Hessian countryside. But I do not expect that, and I don't want to base my optimism, my positive outlook on these dreams that its energy have, and therefore I don't want that our energy policy is based on these. I want our energy policy based on reliable, mature technology so that we can be certain that we can sustainably for the long term have a supply of energy that is plentiful enough, that is secure enough, and that's cheap enough um, that I can sleep well for my future and for the future of uh, the children that I plan on having in the future. So, all so I cheer for its energy um, when they have success. I will really do that. But when they go around and promoting their reactor as the solution to all of our energy problems, which will lead to less resources and capital and political goodwill being allocated to pressurized and sodium pressurized water, boiling water and sodium cooled reactors, which definitely can solve our energy problems. I'm not I do not like that, sorry. So we're going to have to leave it here in the next couple of minutes. Um, so I'm going to kind of take the mic and do one last reflection here. Um, I've been reading uh, a fair amount about nuclear history recently, mostly on the Canadian side, and it's just leading me to realize that we have this unique moment um, of scientific and technical mobilization in the form of the Manhattan Project and what I'll call the Manhattan Project North. The original Canadian nuclear um, research facilities were very much um, you know, pursuing the same goals uh, as the nuclear research south of the border, which was weapons technology. This led to massive wartime spending. Um, and an incredible accumulation of human and institutional capacity. And when the war was over, and particularly Canada was not interested in being nuclear armed 
um, we devoted those resources towards research and engineering to develop this lineage of the pressurized heavy water reactor. And we iterated, iterated, iterated. We went through three or four different uh, research reactor designs, culminating in the National Power Demonstration Reactor, a 20 megawatt can-do precursor. Then we went to 200 megawatts at Douglas Point. 500 megawatts at, at Pickering, uh, 800 at uh, Bruce, 900 at Darlington. Now we're hopefully heading for a gigawatt. But iteratively, we've run into all kinds of problems. We've troubleshot them. But at the nucleus of that is an incredible investment. And I, I hope it's not a one-time investment, but you can see sort of why it was. Um, you know, hearing stats around the Manhattan Project consuming like 6 or 7% of U.S. electricity, this gives you a sense just of one element of the resources poured into this project, which had that spillover effect of leading to the design uh, moving through the valley of death on certain reactor technologies and the ones that advanced, advanced. Um, so I just want to give that context. And, and I think for a lot of these other concepts to advance, I'm, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic because I think that they need a similar mobilization of, of scientific resources. And I'm not sure that we have that at the present moment. I am not even going to let you respond to that. We're going to leave that as a pregnant pause. Um, we're going to have you just be for interest of time. Hard stop. I've got to go and I got to go talk about Pickering on national media. Um, but uh, I do want to have you back because uh, we didn't pull on that sodium uh, cooled reactor thread. Um, and I'd like to finish this excellent conversation about process heat. You know, I've even heard people say that a reason to be pro fusion is because we could use process heat from fusion. I'm, I'm very interested to hear your perspective on that, but I'm not going to let you share it right now. Noel Repberg. Great to have you back on the podcast. I'm sure um, this is going to earn you some lovers and haters, uh, but thank you for doing what you do and being able to offer a perspective. I think because you don't work in the industry, you're able to say a lot. Maybe because there is no German industry anymore, you're able to be very um, uh, free with with your thoughts. And that's what we love on Decouple is, is people that can come and um, offer, offer opinions uh, freely. That's without, a nice uh, way of saying I have questionable qualifications. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let, the, we'll let the audience judge, Noah. Uh, awesome to have you back and uh, we will talk again soon. Uh, bye. <laughs>